okay? These are some of the bundle of rights that go with real estate. So it's possession now. You, you should have that paper that shows the bundle. So we're at our fourth or fifth session. Technically, this is the four. We did four classes, one for the entry tour. This is the fifth class in here, the sixth session. All right, very good. Thank you for keeping track of that. Um, where we're at now, so we have a 12 o'clock class, a 2 o'clock class, and I'm not going to lie, we had a real vigorous session last Saturday. Um, at 48th Street, which is the house that we're invested in. And we emptied all the construction debris. So it was two whole truck loads uh, from the basement all the way to the top floor. Everything got put out. The basement still needs to be cleaned out. So we had two gentlemen from our investment group. And just so that you can know the scope of the people that uh, have been involved with this project is that um, this started with Black Communities Action Committee, and we've got about 1,700 members, but they're all over the country. All right, and cut real quick, though, you can continue, but don't keep looking at the camera. Just talk to me and pretend like these are people. Okay. Just go between, like, the water bottles and me, and I'm okay. just, I'm really going to listen, so. Yeah. Okay, so um, we started out with Black Communities Action Committee, which um, is about 1,700 people. And then um, I started to advertise the real estate classes, and that allegedly attracted 50,000 people that was interested, and 2,000 people were allegedly coming, and about 30 people have been in and out the class. And so now we're at the sixth session, and we have, for 12 o'clock, one person, okay, which is cool, okay, because there's a, um, I guess like a transformation that happens when you start doing something community-wise. We don't have any funding, so there's no incentive for people to come get a check. This is to better themselves, okay. Um, when my son came to videotape this, he, you know, you like... Where's everybody at? Nobody's here. Two o'clock class, there might be some people here, mm -hmm. okay? But it's cool because what has happened is my phone rings constantly with people who have said, I'm ready to do a specific act or function. So we got a brother in Washington State that's going to... We got a brother in Washington State that's going to help with us doing the conservatorship um, paperwork. And that's where in the city of Philadelphia, in the state of Pennsylvania, a blighted house can be gotten for free, okay? Uh, we got a sister out of Germantown that's gonna be working on the paperwork too. Um, and so we're also trying to get 48th Street profitable, situated, renovated, and everybody's working on that. So what has happened is you might not have people sitting in the seats, but you got people doing the things that need to be done. I'm happy to see my son here. He got all the dust from doing the spackling and the sanding because really you want to get into real estate development. It's not about sitting at a table. It's not about talking online. It's not about arguing. It's about the spackling, the throwing out the stuff, um, and everything that it takes to develop property, looking at properties, it's not about sitting here in the room. And what also I talked to, um, I was talking to Leah when she started drywall in the other rooms, and she she was talking about possibly using Tracy to um, to do the demolition to get the drywall from upstairs. I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna go with them. Like I'm gonna help them for free. Like she gonna pay them, but I'm gonna help them for free to take it down and to put it up because I'm gonna learn how to drywall. Because it's something that if I'm gonna do real estate, it's something that I'm gonna that's gonna be cons constant. Now you want constantly need done. That's actually not that hard to do. Where I can save myself money and understand when somebody else knows what they're doing or don't know what they're doing. Right, and and simple things like what did we learn from the one bedroom, from taking down the walls in one bedroom? We got the chance to see the roof, 
the insulation, the beams that the drywall is connected to, and we were told how there has to be enough drywall nails. We had Kevin Kennedy from um, Our Valuable Home, which is on uh, 610 WIP. He came out and he said, look, there's not enough drywall screws in this ceiling. And this ceiling is going to fall. And so we all live in houses. We should know what the guts look like. I never knew that it's, it's uh, what are they called, 24-inch beams, beams or something? Yeah that your drywall ceiling attaches to and that the insulation lays between. So we got to see the roof with all the stains on it from the interior. We got to see that um, there was sunlight. Coming through. It was coming through, okay. We learned that the roof is was beyond its useful life. Um, we also learned that a junction box needs to be exposed. That's right. Put up the ceiling. Yeah, and the guy who did the drywall wrong Tucks the tucks junction the box. box. Yeah, so e even I had a thought when y'all drywall where that junction box is, are y'all slapping wet plaster in that space? I'm not, I gotta look again. Yeah. Because that's what I wasn't sure about. Yeah, because I was thinking uh, me and Leah should actually start to tour some of the upscale renovations because I believe you can put. Um, I forget the exact name of it, but um, same thing like baseboards, but it goes mm -hmm. on the ceiling, crown mm -hmm. molding, yeah. instead of slapping wet cement, because somebody's going to get electrocuted. Mm -hmm. So instead of putting wet spackle anywhere near that junction box and having it blob out, mm -hmm. because as far as I know, the jun junction box was tucked under the insulation. Yeah, I remember it was tucked somewhere, and I wasn't sure if they were moving it when they fixed the ceiling, I don't know. Right? So those are a lot of the things. That's the conversation she, we should be having. A lot of times we're online having these big theoretical conversations about renovating big giant warehouses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like on the hoop dream, which is nothing wrong with that, but you got to understand the basics to even step into the hoop dream. Yes. Okay, so um, the other thing was not covering the tub access. With drywall, mm -hmm. okay. Um, you don't uh, put your outlet covers in your switch blade, switch plate covers, or switch plate covers, okay. By punching a hole through the drywall. Did you see when yeah, the guy yeah, did but, that? <laughs> but the but the second guy fixed it. Yeah, he, he cut made out a nice um, fittings for him. Yeah, and then remember, look how close those nails are. Mm -hmm. Did he make the holes too big or not? So, I mean, it was a lot of learning, and the people that did show up for class got a chance to talk to professionals about it. Um, and uh, so that was real interesting. And I think there was some blobbed out um, the taping that goes on the spackle. Y'all yeah. ripped that off? Most of it. Cool. Okay, because it's going to keep showing up and showing up yeah, and showing yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. So just tear it off spackle it and then sand it down okay so um you know that's the active part of of real estate development and understanding that i can't drywall but when i walk into a room you i can tell what's what it takes and what's done correctly and what's not right like and that's the thing you don't have to like even just because i'm suggesting that i want to learn how to do it myself it's not like you have to learn how to do it but you need to understand the process at least enough to know when your work is being done correctly for somebody to ruin your property. Right, right. Okay. Um, now, the second part of, of this particular class is um, I am trying to get everybody that's participating in this class to do the exercise. Okay? So, one of the first exercises that I placed in the online class was for people to write about their community, okay? Um, to write and describe their community. Um, even if you have to talk about what you'd like to see in your community, but primarily talk about what do you use in your community. So I would like my son, who you can hear his voice, to go ahead and at least do that part. Write about the community, where you live, 
the amenities in your community that you use. All right, thank you. Give me one minute. Okay, so um, <laughs> write about the amenities that you use in your community. What kind of structure you live in? What kind of structure is surrounding? How much you travel in and out? If you could give me one page, because that's been a challenge. People want to passively sit back and quote unquote learn, but you got to learn by doing. Mm -hmm. And not only do you have to drywall and spackle, and I thank you for helping me videotape this and for listening to me. I'm very appreciative of that. But let's also put some targeted thought. Excuse me, I look crazy right now because I was helping with some spackling and sanding a drywall. My lips probably actually, and I came straight here. But, um,. This is the assignment for basically writing about your community that was given, that I was just given. So I'm just go ahead and read. All right, so here's basically my paper on the community that I'm staying with. I'm originally from Philadelphia. I'm in Philly a lot, but currently I'm staying in Abington, so I chose to write about that. Um, so here we go. Currently, I am temporarily staying in Abington on the border of Glenside, PA. In this community, the homes are very diverse and may vary from street to street. On the street that I live, there are single homes, twin homes, and even townhouses. The plot of land that my home sits on is very large and the houses on my block are spaced apart and all have their own driveway as well as garage. Most families have several cars and the roads are well maintained for the most part. Bars, convenience stores, gas stations, and restaurants are scattered throughout the community, community mostly within a few minutes drive, hence the two or more cars per household. Within walking distance from my home is a 7-Eleven, Wawa, and gas station, which I frequent. Public transportation is minimal, but the 22 bus and regional rails are both within two to three minutes walking distance from home, which both can bring you into the city. I have only used the regional rails to get into the city once, but mostly drive a 40-minute commute. There is a high school track I use often to roam with my girlfriend that I believe is accessible to the public, and two LA fitnesses as well as uh, Planet Fitness, which I have a membership to, all within ten, five to 10 minutes drive away. Trash and recyclables are collected on Wednesdays, actually Thursday mornings, and three cans for trash, plastic, and glass, and paper are provided by the municipality. So that's basically what I got out of it. As you will find Ryan's assignment um, in the PDF area, um, but what we talked about when he first read this to me, I was, um, it, it was a lot of information. It tells us that uh, communities are planned. A lot of times in the city, when people get upset about gentrification, they don't realize that what real gentrification is, is the fact that a group of people got together and they planned what their community was going to look like, what was going to be available. So even something as simple as it took planning for the area that you live in to decide that there was going to be a need for driveways, that certain things were going to be walking distance and certain things were going to be driving distance. Your Probably your meal patterns is probably controlled by what you have access to. Yeah, so it's like I eat a lot of Chinese because there's like three or four of those. And um, we've been, I've been trying to switch it up now, though. But it's like there's a bar up the street that's right there that we go to a lot on a regular. And between like Wawa, Chinese, and a bar, that's basically what we eat on when we go out to eat. But now we've been changing it because we don't eat meat no more. So now there's actually a healthy fast food place that just popped up. But that's going to be further. So that's like a 15-minute drive away mm -hmm. that we've been going to now. Kind of switching it up to stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you think about current trends, the working out, you've got a track nearby. Um, if this was an area that wanted to attract families, then they'll... There'd be a big, beautiful school somewhere. There is, yeah. There's a big, there's a big, really nice elementary, which is like Abington uh, Elementary, and then there's Abington High School. They're all within like five minutes, both the elementary and the high school. Mm-hmm. Okay, so 
we sit here, we're in fear of gentrification. We see a building built with 50 units and then we start to see this young person with a new bakery and this cool jazzy person with a cool thrift shop and then uh, what's another business that props up in a gentrified area? Vegan stores. Yeah. Say it again. Vegan. Yeah. So. Healthy fast food alternatives. Yeah. So believe this. When the person builds the 50 units, he has a conversation with somebody and decides, here's the things these people are going to need in walking distance. Here's the amount of money and income that we're going to keep in this particular community so the community can keep growing and thriving. You can go to any particular area, um, even with what they tried to do with the Kensington Storefront Challenge. Here's Philly is like the Wild Wild West. So somebody says, well, this developer has Point Breeze and this developer has Germantown. So I'm going to take Kensington. And now I'm going to decide what type of people are going to come and live in Kensington based on the housing stock and what's nearby and what they can access, uh, you know, as far as public transportation. They could work downtown and they don't have to spend as much as Point Breeze and they can come in Kensington. But now once they get to Kensington and they get in the house and they're hungry and they want Chinese food or a drink or they want to run on the track, where are they going to go? Yeah. Where are they going to go exercise? And okay. even with the Kensington Challenge, it was like they were choosing, like they had all these different businesses trying to get spots in their storefronts, and they're choosing what type of businesses they want for what they think is going to be the type of people that's going to be there in the future. That's or right. that's, that's currently switching now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so gentrification is a planned community. Are you planning for your community? Have you thought about what you need in your community to be happy? Have you thought about if you designed a community, what type of people you'd want around you? What would you want for your children? Um, and we got to put economics in there too because you don't just want to be a consumer in your community. We have went to communities and become consumers. We rent, we spend money, we eat, we spend money. Are we buying, developing, planning our communities? Do we know what kind of neighbor we want? And do we have a hand in creating the neighborhood that somebody else who's making forty or fifty thousand dollars will come in and spend their money? You also might want to support the person who's only making twenty because you need enough kids at the school. You need a community to uh, participate in. Can you, I gotta see if somebody's at the door. I really would like everybody to pay attention to the assignments. So that's one of the assignments from lesson one and I'll be uploading uh, more lessons. But until people do the assignments, <laughs> because you've got to get active in actually learning how to plan your community. What did you get out of the assignment? Did you get anything out of it? For me, it just made me realize how actually, more than anything, it actually made me realize how diverse and how convenient that area is. Like as far as not the people, but as far as the actual structure. More than anything, I didn't actually pay attention to how different it is. Like, I'm so used to Philly being uniform. Like you go into communities, it's the same style of homes for like five or six, even ten blocks in a certain area. Like in Kensington, it's all the same type of homes. It's row homes, row homes, row homes, blocks full of row homes, block over, block over. Like we have four blocks that are all identical to each other essentially. Mm -hmm. But when you go when you start getting outside of Philly, it's like like I said, in that single block, I didn't realize how many different styles of homes there is. Like we live in a single floor, a single home that's one story. Mm -hmm. With a basement, so I guess with a basement is that technically two stories? Do they consider that two stories? No, it's only uh -uh. what's above ground, right? Yes. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. So when I, like the home I live in is a single home, one story. To the left, single home, one story. Across, twin home. Next to it, with a big space, another twin home. Down the block, town homes. Next to that, single story, one home. Then if you just go up to the block to my uh, one of my friends' house. She lives in a two-car garage, two-story, single home. It's like, it's a lot of different homes scattered around. Even in the same block, we got three different style homes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I didn't really notice that. And then just the, uh, how, how convenient it is.
as far as like how even though it's not a lot of public transportation there still are like they definitely i feel like whoever started developing that developed it around the regional rails so okay. that like everybody like the buses don't really run it's only really one bus i really see one or two buses but um but the regional rails a lot of people use that that's walking distance for mostly everybody in that community even if you're mm. three or four blocks away so i know whoever did that they thought let's work from the regional rails out you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that yeah. most people gonna need cars, but now everybody also still has access to the regional roads, which will take you further out or take you directly back into the city. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, so I'm glad you got that out of of uh, that lesson. Okay, so uh, the last thing we're going to deal with is uh, in the PDF area. We're going to have some information on environmental hazards. Okay, um, we'll probably talk more about that. Um, the next time Ryan films the class because uh, I think we covered a lot I'm going to have information about environmental hazards because as we're renovating 48th Street a lot of people walked in and said oh that's asbestos that's lead that's this that's that um, we were supposed to have a radon test and um, uh, because the house was not sealed in its final condition that people would live in the house, a radon test couldn't be done. So radon is a ra radioactive gas. It could be in the city, it could be in the country. It emits from the earth as radioactive material decays. And it could come in the house and cause lung cancer. Uh, we'll talk about lead dust and the lead notification requirements. Asbestos. A lot of times we see... Um, uh, insulation and we immediately think asbestos <laughs> but also insulation was also treated with something called POPs which uh, prevented uh, fire um, it retarded gave it fire resistancy okay um, so there's a whole list of environmental hazards and we'll talk about that next time but I'm going to have a PDF in the lesson, everybody pull that up and start to read about it. Okay? All right.